हैं So I just here just a few more sort of ideas of getting through framing analysis, okay? And so how do we try to get at the underlying assumptions of what we are reading and are hearing? So what do these frames and why is important? Okay, because one of the first questions we really have to ask. But it also means what do they take for granted? What are some of the assumptions that they make in that in what in constructing what is significant? Right? This issue of what is excluded becomes extremely important. Um, and as I said, what worldviews, right? Conceptual, theoretical ideas are actually now being propagated through this frame, right? What are they reinforcing? Why, by taking this narrative, how is it buying me into, you know, a hardcore sort of Marxist labor analysis of something compared to some perhaps bourgeois theory of capitalist liberal development or something? Um, right? You can take it into one way versus another. Um, but also, it also raises the question: Does it allow us to start to imagine a different society? And this is where it also comes back to that question of responsibility. What is our responsibility? How does our research ultimately contribute to something new and better? Okay. I want to give. I try to do this quickly, but a little exercise. Okay. And I have three sample articles here, okay? All about the same thing. This took place in, um, in the United States, the city of Milwaukee, okay? So here's the first story, okay? So an infant left sleeping in his crib was bitten repeatedly by rats while his 16-year-old mother went to cash her welfare check. A neighbor responded to the cries of the infant and brought the child to St. Joseph's Hospital where he was treated and released into his mother's custody. The mother, Angie Burns in Milwaukee, explained softly, has only gone five minutes. I left the door open so my neighbor would hear him if he woke up. I never thought this would happen in the daylight. Okay? Now, if you're familiar at all with American politics, this is related with tacit theories about the world. One of them is the irresponsibility of teenage mothers, welfare mothers, right? All the responsibility is on this 16-year-old girl, right? Who left her baby unattended, cash her welfare check, right? The very clear sort of messages come out of that. But here's another take on the same story. An eight-month-old Milwaukee boy was treated and released from St. Joseph's Hospital yesterday after he was bitten by rats while he was sleeping in his crib. Tenants said that repeated requests for extermination had been ignored by the landlord, Henry Brown. Brown claimed that the problem lay with the tenant's improper disposal of garbage. I spent half my time cleaning, cleaning up after them. They throw the garbage out the window into the back alley, and the kids steal the garbage can covers for sliding in the snow. Okay? No teenage mother, no welfare check in this story. Okay? Here we have what we call in the U.S. a slumlord, somebody who runs an apartment building where poor, where poor people tend to live, makes tons of money off of them, doesn't show any responsibility, but then it also gets into the poor people themselves as being irresponsible, right? And here's a final story. Rats bit eight-month-old Michael Burns five times yesterday as he napped in his crib. Burns is the latest victim of a rat at the death, plaguing inner-city neighborhoods labeled the zone of death. Health officials say infant mortality rates in these neighborhoods approach those in many third world countries. A public health department spokesman explained that federal and state cutbacks 
to force short staffing and rack control and housing inspection programs. The result, noted Juan Nunez, MD, a pediatrician at St. Joseph's Hospital, is a five-fold increase in rat bites. Okay. What's the frame here? Health departments has been different. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Third world country gets pulled out. Yes. No people are involved. It's institutions. Global problem. Right? It's a completely different story. Right? One welfare mother, one slumlord and poor people. Another is irresponsible government and poverty, structural poverty, right? Same story, ultimately. An eight-month-old baby being bit by a rat. But how we present it, right? Each one of these has a politics, too. If you were to read only the first one, right? And not a politics of what it represents, but a politics of what it expects us to do. Okay? So if you read the first one, what sort of actions might you take? You want to, this is horrible, we need to stop this. What would you do? Limited government policies on African American. Yeah. For poor people, welfare mothers, teen mothers, something needs to be done to stop teen mothers, right? So, or welfare checks. The second one, there has to be some way of inspecting, you know, some words. The third one, obviously a lot more politics here. Right? We have to get involved, we have to write our government, we have to get more funding, do something, right? So it's not just representation, it's not just sort of a political world view, but it's also action and what's expected of us. I'm going to skip this part. Okay. The other thing in the United States, right? This, again, these are just little ways of framing issues, right? You're familiar with, there's been what's called the Muslim ban in the United States, right? So, do people arguing, right? We have Muslims and men, but there are 3.5 billion men, 1.6 billion Muslims. But terrorists are often Muslims, and terrorists are almost always men. But that's just stupid. Yeah. Right? So we tend to emphasize in American and American media Muslim terrorists, right? But why not men? Men are committing these crimes. And so again, that framing of are we focusing on the Muslim, are we focusing on the man, okay? What aspect of that are we going, is the Muslim an immigrant? Are they American born? Why do we just call them this, not that, right? Labels matter. And so here's another one you might have seen circulating, of just in some ways perception. Okay. So, because you're right does not mean I'm wrong, you just haven't seen life from my side, right? Is it a six or is it a nine? How many say it's a six? How many say it's a nine? But how do we frame this? We're research, we're scholars, right? We're not opinion makers. One of these people are wrong. Right? It's either a six or a nine. Right? How do we figure that out? We have to do some research. Okay? So someone painted a six or a nine. They need to back up and orient themselves. Are there other numbers in which we can see then which is up and which is down? Right? The ways in which it relates to the context in which it exists. Right? As soon as you take something out of context, we lose its meaning. It could be a six or it could be a nine. But when it's in its context, we know it's one or the other. 
And so understanding that larger context then, we might have to go and dialogue with someone. We have to do oral history. Who painted this? Let's go find out. So the ways in which we can actually get at the truth rather than just asserting opinion. So another push for humanities, right? We all hear that all the money goes to STEM and all these other fields. Um, but those of us in the humanities and social sciences, right? We actually have a role, right? Responsibility to speak up and speak back, right? And finally, this is another one we might have seen circulated, right? Usually it's about two frames. So three young kids out watching the American baseball game, but because of the fence, they have equality. They all have one box to stand on, right? But obviously, that doesn't really solve any problems. So equity is a different concept allows them all to watch the game. Even though now the short kid has two boxes, and the tall kid has no boxes, but to make it equitable access, right, you have to distribute differently. But what if we add, why don't we just turn down the fence? Right? And so again, what are we advocating? What is our responsibility, particularly when we think about the field, what sort of actions are we advocating? Equality, equity, or justice? Okay. And so how can we, in our own work and our representations, think about actually tearing down the fences so that everyone can see, right? And then you might all be familiar with the PD artist Bansky. So, um, but I would leave it there, and thank you very much. I hope that sort of makes some sense, again, of how we start to reflect on our research process, right? The type of questions we need to ask of our sources, the type of questions we need to ask of ourselves as we're writing up, and ultimately, that sense of responsibility we have to the communities in which we're actually working. I will pass. Do you want to ask questions? Yeah, I think it's other questions. This point. If you have no questions at this moment, I'm sure you have questions. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Better. Uh, framing is a method of perspective. If it's a method, then what's different between content analysis and framing? Um, good question. Content analysis um, focuses more on, I mean, one way to look at it, and I'm going to very simplify it here, but framing analysis tends to look at the tacit, the hidden. Content tends to look at the overt, right? Yes, what is just there on the surface, right? So content tends to look, in a sense, at the data and how the information, the narrative, and how it's presented. Where with framing analysis, you're actually trying to think, what's the story behind the story? Okay. It's a simple way I can put it. So is it a method of perspective? Is it a difference between pattern? It's both, as I see it. Okay. I'm not a communication studies expert, so others might have different sort of ways of looking at it. From my so take as an anthropologist, my perspective as an anthropologist, um, is that it's actually both. It's a methodology of how we actually read something. They're very specific. So the questions of the questions I posed at the beginning of how we get at the, those questions of style, selection of information, etc. That's a methodology, right? But it's also a perspective of how we think about how we ourselves live in the world. We're always, we all operate with frames. That's a natural, we have to. I mean, we cannot tell everything, right? 
And so that is a perspective. But when we frame something, we also have to think of our responsibility. Any other questions at the moment? It's your own session. <laughs> anyway, if you want to take a little yeah. uh, time to think of a question also, sometimes we take a little moment to think, how do we ask a question? I have lots of ideas in my head, but I really don't know how to pose the question, right? Sometimes it happens there. Let's take a quick break. It is um, it's quarter after three o'clock. Let's return at three twenty-seven. Seven minutes mm -hmm. break. Yep. Okay. Good. So people need to use the restroom, the bathroom, whatever. Take a cigarette break. Um, you're welcome to take a seven-minute break and come back. Let's be the be that three twenty. Oh, oh, we have a tea session at three thirty. So why don't we just continue? Sorry. We didn't know. We just know that's Is that okay? Okay. So questions. Let's take 10 minutes of questions before we start the next session. Yes? I don't want to start and then leave up 10 minutes. My stuff. So we can take questions or share something. If you don't have questions and you want to share something about your research or your phrase or what has influenced you to think in a certain way, that would be very helpful. Can we say that we are manipulating some people? We are giving our own perspective. We are manipulating. We are giving the culture is putting his own bias. Who told that the whole lie is Roman? Well, then I said this is more my fantastic style. Throw out my hand grenade. But, um, that's a, it's a really important question, and I think and it's a really difficult one to answer. Because in a lot of cases, and particularly when we're dealing with media, and some of the stuff I skipped over because of time actually dealt with representation of Muslims as terrorists, okay? Um, and the ways in which, and the how that's framed, and how it ignores the statistical realities that, you know, I mean, all terrorist attacks in the world, I mean, only 6% are actually committed by Muslims. So this, this association of Islam and terrorism breaks down when you actually get into statistics. But people who talk about that have a politics. And they're interested in actually propagating an agenda. Okay? So, um, and, and in this case, I mean, part of this particular case with Islamophobia, it's an industry. Right? So people are making millions of dollars propagating fear in the West about Muslims. Right? That is very different. So they use brains right, with intentionality to manipulate ideas okay? and create difference and um, um, fear towards the other. Compared to, in a sense, as scholars, again, in theory, when we, when our intentions are sort of pure, and we're entering into ideas of dialogue, and I recognize that my frame is, in a sense, a perspective, but that there are other frames out there, and my frame is, in a sense, in dialogue with these other frames, that my frame might change down the road Right? That I'm not like, this is the reality and only this is the truth that you have to buy it or be killed or whatever the case may be. Those are two different approaches to using frame. Okay. So one might talk about, in a sense, that's why I sort of call it dialogical frames versus these very, in a sense, absolutist frames. Okay. They're both frames. They both show sort of perspective, but one is open-minded, one is dialogical, one is willing to change, right? Where the other is imposing an idea, a truth with a capital T, and only this is the way to go. Does that answer? Yeah. 
really complicating the thing. I think, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, again, I'm not a media person, a communication studies person. Her question was, by choosing frames, are you manipulating knowledge? Okay, what we get to know, what we don't. Now, Professor Hinkle's response to it was that yes, we all operate with frames. It's not, we do not live in, we are all subjective, we are human. There is nothing called an objective way of looking. Because we don't know truth. There is nothing called truth in a, some kind of absolute frozen compartment that we can just go, take it out, and produce it, right? So in some way, being subjective, we are not thinking we are manipulating. We think we are presenting a kind of truth that we know at the moment. Is that manipulation or is that a selective way of knowing? Um, um, we can never know all of knowledge, so it's a selective. So in the selection, we have to ask the question, which Professor Hayes earlier talked about, the question of ethics. Why do we select something a certain way? Is it my gender? that forces me to look at something in a certain way? Is it my religion? Is it my politics? My region? Like I thought somebody is from Maharashtra, somebody is from Osmania, Hyderabad, you know, somebody is from Jammu, uh, Kashmir. You are all from all over. So how do we see somebody who is not from Assam, is studying Assam, how does that person see, right? So in a way, we see something not because we are drawn this in our head to lie, but we have our subjective position that makes us look at something and then we produce knowledge which others may think is manipulated knowledge because we are controlled by so many other factors but perhaps in the researcher we are not manipulating. We are only presenting whatever selective truth we know. The humility of research has always, should be always there. Okay? You must always know, I think, to say that I am always learning something. Right? Keeping it open, what Dr. Hain said, the dialogical process is to remain open. Yes, I am a woman and I write this way and these are the topics I study about because this is an experience I can understand, relate, I know something about it. You, as a man, coming from somewhere else, may be doing this, 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 this way. This is also valid, this is valid. There may be a third and a fourth and a fifth position. It's to remain open that the multiple position they are not manipulation, they are a selective representation. But, that is a researcher's point of view. There are other points of view, such as say the corporation studying the, the defense industry that wants to sell a lot of arms to the police at the moment. So you are signing up in America, trillion dollar deals in Saudi Arabia to buy. Right? Cut off for, for a little bit of time, was cut off from the rest of the world. Now suddenly America is going to sell them a lot of arms and they are going to be mean. Right? That frame is manipulation. First to make them look like you are terrorists. Now in order to, you are not then the terrorists, but you have terrorists inside you. So for this government to take care of terrorists, buy our arms and kill those terrorists and make the world safe. That is manipulation by certain agencies. Right? So a researcher's manipulation or researcher's subjective truth is not the same. In this present author novel, whether it can be a selective, but he doesn't put his own uh, bias. No, no, we always have bias. We we'll always have bias. Bias can be negative and positive. We can have positive bias. Okay? And so we are all biased. Don't use the word bias only in a negative way. Yeah. Yeah. But Good bias, like if you want to, like the street frames that Professor Hen showed and said, finally the third frame that said government must change and sort of provide better cleaning facilities so those rats don't come and you know, attack little babies and then have kids. That is for welfare of a larger society, right? So that is an important way because, and that's an important direction in order to change and create more opportunities of good life for even the poor. Right? But it is a perspective, it's, it is a way of thinking. It is a bias, the bias flows more. Okay? Can you understand? So, you are manipulating the thought, the thought for a purpose of improving lives. That's a good question. So, step by step, when you think of it, it might give you a better sense of your own research, your own projects, and how this project can have a social impact and positive. So let's not take a break. I know I'm